lights down low. Hi, I'm Doug Hoyt from Sounds Like Music Recording Studio, and you're watching Musicians on the Record. Hit it. Bring it on! Well, welcome to the show, Doug. I'm so excited to be in this beautiful studio. How did this all come about, Sounds Like Music Recording Studio? Um, well, actually, I started Sounds Like Music Recording Studio back in the mid-90s. And when I started doing that, the digital world that we know of uh, now that we use for recording really didn't exist, at least, at least not for somebody that had a certain amount of finances to be dealing with. So what I ended up doing was using tape. I ended up getting uh, eight track reel to reel tapes. For analog. We're talking a analog, yes. yeah, which I actually have over there in the, in the corner still, okay. kind of collecting dust. But right. if anybody wants an analog sound, sure. we can do that here. Yeah. Uh, but that's how I started, you know, pretty, pretty uh, bare bones, uh, just using tape. There was no, you know, you, you had to work with the tracks that you had. And I didn't realize it at the time, but that was kind of like, you know, what we know of now is old school recording where you don't have the 62 tracks, you right. had the eight and you had to make it work. So that's how I learned yeah. using that. And that's when I started the studio was, you know, mm. mid nineties. Okay. If someone has never recorded before, what should they expect? What kind of tips or preparation should they know about of coming into a studio like this? Okay. Well, recording in general is stressful. And one of the things that I've, set out to do as a recording engineer and as somebody that owns a studio is to create an environment that's very comfortable mm -hmm. and uh, the, I guess the word I'd be looking for the words is it, it, it's not sterile it doesn't it's not intimidating so when you when you come to record here it's relaxing uh, you, you try to set the performers mind at ease you know right away get them comfortable with the space now what should they bring before they arrive at the studio they sh should have an understanding of what they want to achieve when the project is done so I think you know somebody who's been doing it a while probably already knows this but some of the younger performers they might just think okay I could just show up and then this magic will happen and uh, the end result will be exactly what I was hoping for that's great and sometimes that does work okay. But usually what we recommend is that before you spend your hard-earned money on recording time, that when you come here, you have an idea of what you want to do and an idea of what you're going to do. In other words, if you're going to be doing three songs, mm -hmm. then it's very helpful to know those songs extremely well. Because once you start recording, this, the pressure sure. automatically yeah. you know becomes evident sure. you know whether you think you're that's going to escape you or not I have yet to see that right. everybody even even the best musicians in the world the best studio musicians once that record light goes on it's go time sure. and so having that uh, preparation yes. of what they want to play yeah. and I mean because of so many things let me put this down here. But because so many things have changed, meaning it's not like the 70s with like Sound, Stu Sound City or Stu where you go in and you go, I have no ideas, but let's make an album and let's write. And those days are pretty much gone. Or if somebody wants to do that with you, they can spend the money and sure, do it. Right? And, sure. And even back then, it was about money. You know, the people that were doing that were, were, were high caliber, you, you know, That's recording right. acts. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Do most people come in with like an EP or one? Wanting to record three to five songs, what what are you seeing? Uh, I see a, a trend of the the three to five song EP for sure. Yeah, but you always get an artist that that wants to sit for a while and maybe take actually you know 
two to three months and work on a project, okay. which is which is always fun and yeah. you know great to be involved with. Sure. Can you say uh, if you are able to say a couple of names who you have recorded and? Who's well, I'm, I'll mention one of the the most recent ones because I don't think she would mind. But the the one of the most recent projects I worked on was the Lori Jones Band. Sure album and um, that was just a pleasure to work on she knew what she wanted for a sound she had the songs prepared before she came to the studio so uh, we call that initially when we're when we're laying down the recording we call that tracking and the initial tracking sessions went very smoothly with that particular project and then we could spend more time on developing the mix as we went. So that's all part of your role as an engineer, not only recording it, but getting the sound right, the different tracks, the different levels. Exactly, because what you're talking about here is something that's artistic. It's art, right? So uh, everybody has an idea of what something should sound like, and everybody has an idea of what something good sounds like. And we might like, you might like the sound of a particular snare drum, say, and somebody else might come in, the artist that might be working with you, if you were drumming on it, they might say, well, I don't like that snare drum. Could you swap it out? And you might be thinking to yourself, what do you mean? The right. snare drum's great. <laughs> so yeah, it does come into, you know, I think working the uh, compromises when, when you can, and finding that happy medium with the artists and, and the engineer. Yeah, and the wonderful Lori Jones, we had her on the show, check her interview and episode out. She's a wonderful guitarist, singer. Uh, what's your role in that, like you said, if something isn't sort of sounding right or an artist has a vision of uh, how do you sort of artfully kind of help them maybe see another way? That's a really good question. Um, basically, when you get into a situation where you're trying to work on a sound, the best line of defense for that is to try to understand what that sound is at the very beginning, because then you're not pedaling backwards trying to find it. Uh, you know, you, you, you place the microphones, you uh, tune the instruments. You know, sometimes you come in and, and you think your guitar sounds great. Well, the intonation might be off. So, you know, maybe the guitar needs to be worked on before you can actually, you know, get a decent recording out of it. Maybe the drums haven't been tuned in 10 years or so, you know. <laughs> uh, maybe they need new drum heads. Uh, so these are all things at the, at the very beginning when you're starting to record that, that obviously I think most engineers try to accomplish is to get the best sound possible at first. After that, it, it does become a bit of, like I said, the artistic flair of how you're going to make it sound do you want to make it sound like it's buried under water <laughs> does it does it sound like it's in a room full of pillows does it sound like it's in a, a giant gymnasium somewhere and these are all things that help shape the mix okay and certainly the sound of the room will have an effect on that Definitely. right yep. yeah. and all of that amazing equipment you have right there and we'll show some of it uh, that has an effect on it too exactly. correct yeah yeah, yeah. So, I mean, clearly this is a passion. You've made this your life. You're, you're making a living out of it. And it's not just like, yeah, I think I'll do music. I mean, tell us a little bit about your music story. When did your passion for music start? Well, um, I always say to people, it, I didn't, it, and it sounds like a cliche, but most cliches are true. Yeah. I, I didn't choose this, it, it chose me. So I started uh, listening to records at a very early age before I even started elementary school. I was buying records. Um, and wearing out record players and, you know, spending more time inside listening to music probably than I than I should have been, um, and you know this was the 70s. There was there was no internet, uh, <laughs> so I I spent a good deal of time uh, listening to music and and I still do. I still listen to music every day. I, I work around it, but I've I've never tired of it. I still that's in addition to recording. Probably my my other passion and hobby is you know collecting you know hi-fi equipment and you know buying records. Records, buying vinyl, you know, listening yeah. that way. Great, great hobby. But yeah, yeah, but it started. But I always say it's, it started very young. Uh, the 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 musician side didn't start until probably I, I got into my teen years, and in high school and started playing in bands. Okay. And so, who were you listening to as a kid? Because obviously, something about music and musicians caught you. Well. 
I always say I, I feel very fortunate to have, uh, you know, uh, be born when I was because I was a kid in the 70s. Yeah. So that meant that the top 40 radio that I was exposed to had everything from disco to country right. Right. to what we know as rock and roll. So I learned very early on to, to not pick any one style of music. I like most everything. Yeah, and the thing that I actually discovered years later was more into classical. I probably got my first experience from classical watching Bugs Bunny. <laughs> right? Yeah. Honestly, you know, yeah, it wasn't right. something. But more the top 40 stuff, everything from, you know, the Joe Walsh, Rocky Mountain Way would have been one of my 45s that I got to to theme songs from shows like SWAT or the Rockford yeah, Files, right, right. dating myself. But, <laughs> but those, those were yeah. things that, that were sure. part of my... Uh, sound landscape, if you will. It's great. It's great. And so, did you come from a musical family? Uh, other people in the family uh, love music as well. Uh, my, I have a cousin that still plays drums. I used to, uh, you know, pretty much beg him to go over and play his drum set when okay. I when I was little. He was playing in bands, um, so I thought that was pretty cool sure. that he was playing in bands. Um, he's he, in, he has a son that's a very uh, fine drummer as well. Um, it is in the family, okay. but n I'm the only one out of four siblings that became a, a musician. Got it. Um, my older brother always had really good hi-fi gear, so I got exposed at an early age to, hey, that sounds a lot different than my little record player with a three-inch speaker. Why, why does that sound so much better than mine? You know, so. <laughs> so your engineering education started early as well as the music, too. So. I think so. In just picking out little things, listening to headphones and hearing stereo separation, listening to a Sticks album or something and hearing things bank between the left and right yeah. speakers and saying to myself, well, how are they doing that? So inherently, whether I knew it or not, the groundwork was being laid for me to be an audio engineer at a very early age. I had re things to record on as a kid. I had cassettes that, that you could record, but nothing, you know, just, hey, what's this do? And you talk into it and you hear yourself back, you know, and say, hey, that's pretty fun. The most basic. Of the most basic of all of it. And when it comes right down to it, you know, that's, I guess that's a philosophy I've always kept with. I try not to overthink the recording process. I try to keep it as simple. Yeah. Love it. as possible and stay out of the way of the musician and let them do their thing you you yeah awesome so when did you playing music then come into the picture you said around 16 yeah I, I got the drum kit we were talking about earlier I've got this beautiful 1968 uh, Ludwig kit um, and that that uh, I acquired that probably around 1984 mm -hmm. And, or, and I uh, was in a band pretty much that weekend that I got it. Uh, honestly, I, I learned how to play drums sitting at the end of my bed listening to ACDC's Back in Black. <laughs> it, it, it was a very fundamental record. It's a powerhouse album. It's uh, very straightforward backbeats. And, it, and I was realizing I was playing without having a drum kit, just making the motions with my hands. And then once I sat down behind it, then it was just getting your muscle memory going. So, right. yeah. mostly self-taught or well, mostly self-taught. Uh, some, some teachers I did take lessons from, our, actually, a guitar teacher that actually taught me how to read drum notation, and that got to a point where, he, and I always am thankful for this because I was pretty young. And he came in one day when I was warming up, and he said, "This will be our last lesson." Mm. And I said, "Why?" He yeah. said, "Because we've got to a point where I can't teach you anymore." Wow. And see to. And I'm not saying that because I was really yeah. good. Yeah. It was just he was a guitar player, but he happened to play drums, yeah. and he did know the notation. Then I took, then I did take lessons uh, from a guy named Al McIntyre okay. that uh, taught me my rudiments, mm -hmm. taught me uh, better syncopation, mm -hmm. and actually got me on the road to learning how to play jazz. Yeah. And you I don't do a lot of it anymore, okay, but okay. back then, this, yeah. is, this is quite a while ago, sure. and back then, you know, I, I was studying it, so yes. I needed to learn how to, to how to swing. So studying in college? Yes. Yeah, excellent. What was that experience like for you? Uh, well, you know, any drummer that's that studied at college knows that one of the first things they do that you may resist is they teach you ear training, and they put you in front of a piano, uh -huh. and you have to learn that whether you like it or not. Right. So I, I am a very rudimentary at best uh, piano player as a result of that, uh, and it was it was a lot of fun. You got to play in jazz ensembles, and it was baptism by fire. A lot of uh, really uh, 
good experiences learning how to sight read mm. and ha had an experience where a teacher gave me an assignment i showed up the next week i had a whole week to do the assignment i came in i couldn't play it the teacher said well i'm going to go get a cup of coffee you go work on that they went had got, got a cup of coffee came back in five minutes while he was gone i thought to myself i'll show him and i looked at the the, the music and I started playing it and then he said okay let's see what you got in that five minutes and I played it note for note and he threw me out he said you're wasting my time you had a whole week to work on that yeah. so for you young musicians out there that was the uh, that was a, a moment for me right. that I've never forgotten so one of your whiplash moments a, yeah, yeah. And, and deservedly so I had a week to work on it and I just didn't put the time in that I should have and yeah. It happens, though, right? Yeah. yeah. Learning curves, we call it. That's those. right. Exactly. Thank God we learned from them, though, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We tried it. Right. We tried it. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, you're doing all of this work. You're playing music. You're learning. You're stu it's not like you're just doing this uh, haphazard. What was the dream that was starting to develop for you, Doug, as far as what you wanted to do with music, where you wanted it to go? Well, I think like anybody who starts out wanting to do something, you, ha you have a goal. Uh, and it might be to some quite delusional mm -hmm. and you know I'm sure the Beatles had a goal right. and I'm sure people around them thought that was delusional right. well right. they became that now right. I never experienced anything like that I'm not I'm just using that as a metaphor sure. yeah. um, I probably when I was 16 years old had dreams of rock superstar sure. probably sure. figured at this time I'd be on my third farewell tour right. at least right. uh, that, that didn't happen. The goal line moves or whatever. You adjust. I've, I've had a great run playing in a lot of different bands over the years. Um, a lot of great experiences playing with different people. And uh, got into teaching, audio engineering, as a result of some of the avenues and roads yes. that I took. Did that for many, many years, over a decade of that. And, um, of course, with the recording studio here that, that I'm running, uh, just always great opportunities to meet new musicians and, and help them develop yeah. and help them sound as good as sure. maybe they hope they would sound. Right. So I think at the, at, the, at, the, at the end of the day, as everyone says, uh, you know, just dealing with music in general is, is pretty magical. Absolutely. You know, yeah. so. so, you know, when we adjust some of our dreams, because not everybody's going to be yeah. the Beatles, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and understandable. You know, one of the things we talk about on the show is, you know, what are some of those successes and what drives somebody's passion for music, as well as what are some of those obstacles or challenges that somebody went through, some of those learning lessons that they had to adapt from. Any of those for you, the challenges with music or? Well, I, I, again, I think when you start out, you have you have visions of, of climbing this ladder yeah. and that just doesn't always happen for everybody. And for, and for me, I got into this comfortable space of, of playing out most every week, um, doing a combination of playing other people's music but always writing songs and always throwing my own music in as well and certainly doing a lot of shows with just my own music. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's always been the most gratifying mm -hmm. is, is when I play the gigs where I'm doing something that I've written yes. and not to take away from anybody that plays cover music because I've certainly done that for years and years. But it was always more gratifying when somebody came up and shook my hand and liked something that I'd written as opposed to... I played a really good cover of one of their favorite songs, and again, not not to take anything away from that from that because that in itself is a special art form too, and that's entertainment. Yes. And when you do find yourself playing, say, out in bars, um, people just like to go out and have a good time, and most people like to hear songs that they know. Sure. Right. You know, and I and I learned that very quickly. If I wanted to stay working, right. I needed to okay. learn how to play more. Yes. more of other people's songs. But anybody who's ever seen me live knows that I usually do versions of other people's sure, songs, right. usually because yeah. it's pretty hard to exactly. mimic what they did exactly. in the studio. Yeah. Can't so, do it. No right, so right. I'll do a version. Sure. And the, so the best compliments from that have always been, I love your version of certain song better than the original. Right. Oh, well, that's great. It's Thanks. Great you know, yeah. that, made, that always made me feel real you good. Bet. What's the kind of music you like to play, whether cover or your own originals? Well, the, the, the main style of music that I play is, is a basic, what I would call straight ahead rock and roll. 
It's not real heavy. Mm -hmm. It's not what I would call jam band music. Yeah, okay. And it's more along the lines of somebody uh, like Tom Petty or Bruce Springsteen okay. or The Who. Yeah. Uh, thing, U2 is another band that yeah. comes to mind sure. that I think that I've, I've always tried to... Uh, not steal from but borrow from i guess is the better the better word these influences i've i've done original pieces of music where when we listen to the mix i've worked with engineers who uh have been say fans of that same style of music and all of a sudden it starts through the playback and i'm like oh well the way that sounds like that sounds like that u2 song that we heard yes. you know da, da, da. okay well i put that in there because it and, I, and, and the song that we would be listening to that I did wouldn't sound anything like it, but you would hear elements of it. And I think that if people really listen to, to music, that there's always a map that goes backwards. And you just got to do your research and some history and, right. and peel back the layers. That's right. And everybody's been influenced by something, sure. even if you're listening to Led Zeppelin. Right. Clearly, they were influenced. Yeah. That's right. By, you know, blues. American blues. You bet. Yeah. <laughs> right. You, you bet. Just Absolutely. putting it under a new, a new dressing. That's right. You know, a new That's jacket. Right. Yeah. What's it like for you as an engineer? And it sounds like you've been on both sides of the board. You 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 record for people, but you've also recorded your own music. What's that process like when you're hearing that back? Because you've got some music released, and we'll put a link to that. But, yeah, that hey, that's an interesting question too because I try not to record my own music. If I'm recording my own music, I'm I'm making w what we would call demos. Okay. And usually, when I get ready to get serious about putting something out, I hire out. Okay. You get <laughs> so, a professional like, yeah. like you are, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. I have a I have a producer that I've been working with for years. Her name is uh, Stephanie Dufresne, and she she works down in Nashville. Wow. And um, she's been working with me, she's almost exclusively now for over 10 years. And we work very well together in, in the studio. Yeah. And she has no problem telling me when something doesn't sound right. Okay. And that's a whole other aspect too. There's a, there's a psycho psychological aspect to it that a lot of people don't realize. Sure. Um, you know, an artist might come in thinking something's great. Yeah. And it, and maybe it is, but maybe it isn't. And having the know-how to mm -hmm. navigate around that and let them know that maybe we might want to go down a different... Because the first album we did together, um, she didn't do that as much. Mm -hmm. And the second one, she was a lot harder on me. Okay. <laughs> she, yeah. she became more comfortable sure. with it. Yeah. You know, tell us about the, your creative process with writing songs and albums, whether your own and or recording for others. Um, everybody has a different approach to writing music. Uh, for me, I usually grab a guitar. It seems like any time I try to write anything, because I'm such a rudimentary piano player, anything I try to write with piano ends up coming out of ballad. No matter what I, what I do, I cannot write a rock, a hard driving rock song with yeah. piano. It's because of my own limitations. Um, I choose to grab an acoustic guitar usually. I'll strum some chords, ideas of, of uh, song uh, structure or themes, mm -hmm. what the songs, because I'm, I'm lyric based. I like, I like stories. I'm a, I'm a Dylan fan. Ah, you, um, you know, I, I love Pete Townsend's lyrics. I, lo I, I love songwriting in general. And so having an idea is, to me, is, is crucial. Mm -hmm. Although many a great song has been written just with a great melody and then the words come later. So I like to have an idea. Melodies and lyrics tend to start meshing with the chords that I start thumbing around with. And then I usually go back through and just clean it up. And on a good day, usually they can come out, you know, pretty quickly. Fantastic. You know, the last one, the recent one I'm working on, I think I knocked out within 20 minutes. Wow. But then the process of demoing it takes a lot longer. Sure. And maybe some fine tuning on some of the lyrics and stuff. But the basic idea usually comes pretty quick. If it doesn't happen, for me, if it doesn't happen fast, it tends to eventually get shelved and maybe use pieces of it might get used yes. on something else. That type of approach also can be helpful in the studio when you're working with an artist. They come in and they have an idea. And, you know, it's, there's a lot of people that say, oh, I'm a producer, I'm a producer. And again, not to knock anything away from that. I think everybody is. I think the people that come to the table with a yeah. song, sure. they, you know, they, they've somewhat produced themselves. What's hard is for them to hire somebody to help them step out of the way a little bit yes. and say, well, maybe it doesn't need to do that part again. Maybe it's getting long. Yeah. 
Um, and, and that's the other thing that's taken me over the years is, is to get out of the way of stuff. The first songs that I wrote, say, 25 years ago, probably were pretty long or, or longer than they should have been or started becoming sounding like I was trying to fit a square and a circle together. I think the longer you do it, at least for me, I keep trying to get it so things flow good and helping artists see that in their sound. I think that's what a good producer should do is kind of step back and hopefully see a vision for that maybe the artists themselves didn't actually hear. Yeah. Or knowing that, hey, I'm going to step aside here because this is fantastic. And it's it's hard. Sure. And then sometimes, you know? sometimes I imagine a spark hits or magic happens yeah. in the studio, and yeah, but, you know, it's, it's like, and again, not to take anything away from anybody that t teaches classes of songwriting and things, because yeah, you can have a formula, but it, it, you know, when it's all said and done, there's been some beautiful pieces of you know pop music written over the years. There was yeah. simply no formula. That's right. You know? That's right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Has it ever happened where an artist comes in your studio and you're helping them, they can't just can't get the music or the song right, and you guys sort of finish it together, and you're on a songwriting credit? Yeah. It will. Yeah. And that could that could happen as as simply as you know, with my drumming background, if they're playing something, I can kind of sit behind a drum kit. And as we all know, you know, we, we like to, some people maybe don't like to give drummers all that much credit, right. but drummers really can shape the way a song's gonna go. Right. So you could right. double time something, half time something, throw a triplet in where it wasn't before. Uh, there's a lot that you can do to shape, and then that might make the songwriter go, oh, mm -hmm. I never heard it that way, right. and then they might, so yeah. ideas start bouncing, you and you I bet. think, you know, if somebody has that in their, in their budget, because again, studio time, right, and we say that usually the upper echelon of, of, of the recording industry has the, you know, finances and the time to sit for months at a time crafting a record, but not everybody has that, and that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, knowing what you want to do before you... Yeah you know book your studio it. time yeah. yeah you come in and, and that makes things go a lot smoother if people want to hear your music doug where can they go and find that probably that well itunes you okay. can find the last album i did is on itunes just doug hoyt and the name of the album is when tomorrow comes and that's on itunes you can always go on right, lately i've been using reverb nation okay simply for the ease of it. Yep. And you can look up Doug Hoyt on Reverb Nation and you can listen to songs that way. Awesome. How many albums have you put out there? Uh, good question. I want to say probably around a dozen. That's fantastic. Or so in different configurations, okay. different bands yeah. and things. Excellent. But I've only recently stepped away from a, a band name and become you know, Doug Hoyt on the last album for that kid. Excellent. Great. So a new trend. So I, you're going solo. A solo I, I, career. I saw a solo yes. career, right? Awesome. Yeah. Now's Love the it. time, right? Hey, Sting yeah. did it. Why right, not? Right, right. right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So can we also talk about the education piece, because you've taught for a long time, and uh, it turns out that we are connected to the same broadcasting school, New England School of Communications in Bangor, Maine, where I went to broadcasting school, and you taught there yes. for years. Yes. How did that even come about? That just was honestly by by chance, I guess, lack of a better word. I uh, came around the school at the right time, and they needed help, and I ended up becoming a teacher. Yeah at a time in my life where I never thought I would be a teacher. Okay. And it ended up being something that I ended up doing for 14 years. It's amazing. I mean, so a happy accident. You weren't looking for it, it no, happened. No, yeah. it was just, it was what we were talking earlier about like, you know, what, what do you want to do when you start out with ideas of, you know, may, maybe being a musician or being in a band? Well, I can tell you without a doubt, the last thing that I would have thought I was going to be for a long period of time in my life was a teacher. Matter of fact, I had a drum instructor tell me once that he thought I'd be a good teacher, okay. and I looked at him like I thought he was crazy. And I'm thinking, well, no, I'm thinking that'd be the last thing I'd want to do. But it was very enjoyable. I, I enjoyed it. I, I loved uh, the experience of meeting new students every year, every semester. Uh, you know, students would teach me things as well as me teaching them and a lot of uh, great people that I met over the years doing that and, they, and a lot of them have gone on to be on really major album releases. Yeah, such as? Know, such as, I've got a student that recently 
um, has been working a lot at Electric Lady Studios in wow. New York and awesome. is in the credits of uh, the last U2 album, the last Springsteen album, the mm. last Beck album. Uh, you know, the list goes on. Sure. You yeah. know, for that particular Pretty student. heavy stuff. Yeah, there. there's a yeah. lot of other students that have gone on to work with other people.